Alexa and Rachel. So, Annalisa, Rachel. Um, thank you. Yes, just had to find the mute button. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so thank you all for joining this afternoon. It's really exciting to see everybody on this Wednesday afternoon. And we are going to dive in on getting ready for the 89th Texas Legislative Session. So when I say getting ready, uh, I think we all know the election is in less than two weeks. Uh, the general election is also for statewide offices, senators and uh, Texas House of Representatives members. Uh, this is key because the week after the Monday following the election is the first day that these either new or returning legislators can start filing bills. So even if they've been elected five days earlier, they can start filing bills. Returning members, of course, uh, can do the same. And this is when uh, our job here at GIA and many of your jobs, if you're in a group that monitors the Texas legislature, we start monitoring these filed bills. So really for us, uh, the legislature begins on November 11th, but officially the legislature will convene on January 14th. And like most things in politics, that is a Tuesday. So Tuesday, January 14th is the convening of the 89th legislature. There is then the next important date is March 14th. That's the 60 day deadline for bill filing. So this is the date by which most bills, unless there is a special uh, local bill or joint resolution that three quarters of the uh, chamber agrees to here, uh, it will have needed to be filed before that March 14th deadline. The last day of the legislature, it's it's uh, quick and dirty. It's June 2nd, 2025. Um, and then the veto deadline for any bills that were passed in the session is June 22nd. So it's really going to be a sprint of uh, just about six months worth of work, but it truly will be a, a sprint and it will be a lot of work. Um, we will be talking later in this presentation about what we'll be doing during those uh, roughly six months and how you can help. <clears throat> so I'm going to flip it over to Annalisa to talk a little bit about the legislative dynamics in this upcoming uh, session. Yeah, and so we haven't had, uh, of course, the elections yet. So there are some seats where we will most likely be seating new legislators. Um, I just want to say uh, we're, I guess, uh, uh, Gia and so many of us are really uh, regretting the loss of Representative Tracy King, who has been the uh, chairman of House Natural Resources for the past several sessions. And under his leadership, um, that committee has been run really well. We do not know who will be replacing him uh, in that he had decided to retire. And we have several of these are uh, members of our local delegation who will not be returning is Representative uh, Casal, uh, Representative Price, uh, Representative Rogers, Representative Thompson, and Representative Murr. And it's, um, I feel like a loss because a lot of these folks uh, have worked with this in the past on, on GIA's agendas. They know our agendas. So going into the session after the election, it's going to be incumbent on all of us uh, to contact the people who are replacing these folks and make sure that they know uh, what our concerns are. Thanks, Rachel. Sure thing. So just going to provide a little bit of an overview of what we're going to be covering today. Um, these are some of our main themes of uh, focus for the legislative session. Of course, uh, seeing as the bills have not been filed yet and seeing as we don't know all of the representatives and senators who will be in office, this is at the moment a fairly good guess. I would say an educated guess, but still a guess of where the priorities are going to be this session. Um, but for that, we're going to cover this afternoon uh, water reuse or recycling, uh, the issues surrounding extraterritorial jurisdictions, the so-called Death Star Bill, which I'll get into, uh, potential land use and housing regulation issues, expanded county authority, water availability, and then talking about some aspects of TW or Texas Water Development Board funding and programs. 
So for the first uh, topic that we're hoping uh, to see a lot about this next session is water reuse, or in other words, wastewater recycling. Uh, it was a charge or a topic that the legislature in the House of Representatives studied during this past year during the interim session. So the House Natural Resources Committee was looking at opportunities to expand the reuse of water in Texas. And there seems to be a really large bipartisan support for expanding reuse in the state. Uh, the hearing itself was very encouraging. Uh, Gia had the opportunity to be invited testimony. So we were able to provide our remarks on this topic and hear from others about water reuse. And so we will continue to advocate for expanded water reuse as one solution to the uh, water availability situation in Texas. And uh, the route we are taking for this topic is advocating for water reuse districts, which would be created by the legislature. If this is something that's interesting to you, we have a whole report on our website and a past Water Wonks lecture. So I'm not gonna get too much into it now, but you're welcome to dive as deep into that topic as you'd like. Our next uh, topic is also one that we have a, um, report on if you're interested further in this topic. Unfortunately, I don't think we have a water wonks lecture on it, but maybe that's something we could do in the future if this comes up um, as a big issue in the legislature. So extraterritorial jurisdictions, uh, there was also a Senate local government committee interim hearing on this issue this fall during the interim session. Uh, we were, uh, Gia submitted testimony at this hearing as well. Uh, it was quite a uh, split in the hearing. It does seem like there will be a rather large push during the legislative session to uh, eliminate extraterritorial jurisdictions altogether, um, rather than implementing some, what we feel is, and some other cities and counties testified as well, of common sense uh, reforms to extraterritorial jurisdictions, given the bills that passed last session. Again, we have a whole report on this if you're interested further, but this is really a area that could have pretty large ramifications for uh, land use and water quality uh, concerns. Uh, one thing that will be interesting to see on this issue is that uh, there is a lawsuit making its way through the Texas court system. Uh, it's called Grand Prairie versus the state of Texas. It's a short title, there's a much longer one. There are currently 20 plaintiffs, which are 20 different cities throughout the state of Texas, large and small, with Grand Prairie leading the charge. Uh, we won't probably know where the legislation on this issue is going to go until we know more about where this uh, court case will end up. So stay tuned on this issue. We definitely will be. The next issue is uh, the Death Start Bill. This will be another um, off uh, defense, uh, same with extraterritorial jurisdictions. Uh, this, if you probably are in Central Texas or live in a large city, you've heard a lot about. House Bill 2127 was passed last session. It's got the uh, fun but ominous name Death Star Bill because it is pretty ominous for the ability of cities, cities and counties to pass local ordinances. Uh, that go further than what's allowed under state law. A lot of cities and counties consider this to be unconstitutional, and a state court actually agreed with uh, the plaintiffs in this instance, but the attorney general appealed. So the law is in effect currently while this litigation continues up to the Texas Supreme Court. This is another one where we probably won't know too much about where it's gonna go until we find out about what happens at the Supreme Court. But again, this is just a really uh, broad law, very expansive attempt to weaken local government's regulatory authority and local ordinance power. And again, that has a lot of ramifications for land use and for water quality and a lot of what GIA works on and what other groups in our alliance work on. Annalisa, did you have something to add on this one? Um, no, not on this one. Okay, perfect. Uh, so the next one is land use and housing regulations. This is another um, topic that we are looking into because of the interim charges that were released in this instance by both the Texas House and Senate. Um, you know, housing is availability and affordability is a big concern in Texas right now. It's something that 
uh, cities and towns and counties of all sizes and all demographics are grappling with. And of course, Gia is uh, very on board with um, working towards solutions to both improve housing availability and housing affordability. One thing we will be monitoring, though, is just the knowledge that these efforts will likely, just knowing the makeup of the House and Senate, include rolling back environmental regulations and flood prevention regulations that can be used to protect water supplies. And so uh, these are things like land use patterns, uh, zoning laws, environmental and pervious cover limits. Uh, ordinances like that um, are often on the chopping block for um, housing affordability changes. So that's just something we will be monitoring um, one potential solution, depending on where any uh, legislation goes, would be supporting and bracketing that legislation. So putting in some restrictions to ensure that the Edwards Aquifer recharge and contributing zones are not affected by any rollback of environmental ordinances or regulations that impact water quality, flooding or water availability. Yeah, and I'd like to add on this one. Um, this is particularly important when we look at the flood prevention regulations. I serve on the region, one of the regional flood planning groups. All of the groups in the states have recommended that municipalities and county governments beef up their flood protection uh, regulations and, and measures. And so uh, this is one that could have potentially disastrous uh, uh, consequences of, of weakening that. Um, and then in terms of bracketing, we have been very successful in the past of getting certain uh, environmentally sensitive areas like the Edwards Aquifer Recharge Zone uh, exempted from, from some of these rollbacks of regulations. So uh, we will have to be really vigilant on continuing to do that and to establish those relationships with our elected representatives within our service area to represent us on that. Yeah, thank you, Annalisa. So I'm actually going to kick it back over to you, Annalisa, for um, our topic of county authority and monitoring that in this upcoming session. Yeah, thank you. So because uh, because of Senate Bill 2038, we're, what we're seeing is areas that were regulated formerly uh, by municipalities as part of their ETJ are now under county authority. And so uh, in order for uh, you know, our, our our counties within our service area, we all know how fast they're growing, not to just become a free-for-all. I think we're going to have to advocate uh, for the legislature to uh, enhance uh, the, the county's ability uh, to regulate uh, protection of natural resources, uh, land use. Right, right now, uh, counties are prohibited from doing zoning, which has caused a lot of problems. Y'all are probably aware of, of certain things like the Vulcan Quarry in Comal County, where they're putting in an, a major industrial operation in the middle of a bunch of neighborhoods. So we're looking for, uh, at, at the minimum, at least buffer zones for certain land use types, particularly when it applies to industrial use, um, uh, to support and clarification and enhance county powers uh, to protect natural resources and the ability to enforce building codes and flood management protections, as I mentioned before, and establish drainage fees and powers. Um, we also are looking at, um, there is a kind of severe uh, uh, caps that the state imposes on impact fees that can be assessed by counties, and we'd like to see those uh, reconsidered. Um, uh, some of our county commissioners, these are at their suggestions as recommended uh, standards for sustainability engineers who are uh, employed by the counties or, or as consultants, uh, stronger standards for water availability studies within the county, which is really important because you can't be putting in all these new developments uh, uh, and putting moving all these new people into our area without making sure that everybody has enough water. Um, and, and then, as we mentioned, uh, wherever we can be vigilant about making sure that um, the Edwards and Trinity aquifers, as karst aquifers that are extremely vulnerable to pollution, are protected um, in anything that moves forward in new legislation. Thanks, Rachel. 
Awesome. Thank you. So um, the next topic is water availability. Of course, you know, last session, the 88th was the deemed the water session of the Texas legislature. This session, we've also heard some rumblings that it'll be another water session. And of course, that's very encouraging, especially considering what happened last session. Uh, we were able to pass the new water supply for Texas fund, and that is to be primarily used to develop water supply projects such as desalination, produced water treatment, aquifer storage and recovery, and the development of infrastructure to transport these new supplies. Uh, GIA, of course, is uh, supportive of this fund and its uses, although we do have some uh, other areas that we would like to advocate for for new water supply, uh, which would be expanded wastewater reuse, expanded applicability of water availability studies. And then with that produced water treatment, we would, uh, I think that's a, a large concern across a lot of groups about, um, you know, what's in the produced water, how it's being used. Um, so even though it is a good uh, potential water supply, ensuring that there will be strict regulations for produced water reuse. Whoops. Um, uh, one thing we would also support is providing groundwater conservation districts with the appropriate resources, which includes updated improved groundwater availability models. A lot of models are currently out of date or the uh, most up-to-date or most comprehensive ones are not being used by these groundwater conservation districts. And these would be to help identify and manage uh, sustainable levels of groundwater pumping in the state. Uh, we also would like to see uh, the management of groundwater and surface water in the state. So whether that's the GCDs or Texas Water Development Board, TCQ, all of those um, authorities recognize the connection between groundwater and surface water. There's quite a disconnect in state regulations and in groundwater conservation district regulations about the uh, very important connection between those two sources. And then this will include uh, funding studies on groundwater surface water interactions. Uh, also, we would, in terms of funding, uh, increasing the funding for the Texas Water Fund, I think that's something a lot of groups would like to see. Um, this is thanks to Sierra Club for, for putting this into a very uh, concise uh, wording, but uh, increase funding as well for the economically distressed areas program, increase funding for studies to support environmental flows for the flood infrastructure fund, which would include funding for nature based solutions. And then for the agriculture, water conservation and a lot of other programs, especially grants and technical assistance to support underserved communities. Uh, one of the things you hear a lot when you talk with uh, conservation districts or other groups on the ground is just that their area does not have the funds or the technical expertise to do what needs to be done to have these updated models or to have the appropriate uh, interact studies done. So in order to have a good water session, these would be things that we would push for. Uh, at the legislature, but again, it will really depend on uh, who's in office, those connections that we're able to forge, that you're able to forge, and just we'll have to see what comes up, but know that we'll be pushing for these. Um, so I'm gonna flip this over to Annalisa to talk about what we've done in the past and what we plan to do this year. Yeah, so every session, uh, uh, we we comb through the bills as they come through. We use Texas Legislature online and get the alerts of when they're filed. We actually read the legislation. Uh, then we start sorting them out into uh, a list of bills, the bills we support, the bills we oppose. And, and uh, by the time the bill filing uh, deadline occurs, we hope to have a comprehensive list of, of the, the bills that we are actually tracking, supporting, and opposing, uh, which we have been able in the past to uh, uh, disseminate to all of the legislators, and they tell us that they find that very helpful. Um, and then uh, we send out during the session, uh, if you are signed up and, and you get the key alerts, which you most likely do because you're on this meeting, um, you, we, we will be giving you opportunities to weigh in on bills that impact GIA's agenda. And so we, we use those judiciously. So there might be, um, say, a committee hearing uh, where we'll say, please contact the members of these this committee and ask them 
to uh, support or oppose as appropriate. A lot of times these committee meetings come up uh, at the last minute. So a lot of these alerts, there might be a short fuse on it, but uh, the legislators tell us that the, um, uh, the uh, uh, communications that they get from our members actually do mean a lot. And so we encourage you to do that. And we urge you to uh, share information and talk uh, about what's going on in the legislature with your family and friends and encourage them to get involved as well. Because like I said, uh, our, our legislators tell us that feedback from our members is really noted and very important. Awesome. Thank you, Annalisa. So I know that was a quick and uh, dirty overview of our um, points of focus for the upcoming legislative session. Uh, if we will be releasing a, a legislative priorities list uh, probably sometime in November. But again, if you have any questions on a couple of these topics, we do already have reports out. There are a couple that will probably be um, publishing either some one pagers or some other reports on. But if you have any questions about any of these, please feel free to reach out to uh, either Annalisa or myself or both of us about these topics. Again, you can find a lot of this information on our website. And then if you want to yourself track these bills and have a deeper understanding and follow along with the legislature, uh, you can go to Texas Legislature online and sign up for the alerts and find out about committees and pretty much anything you would want to do related to the legislature. Uh, GIA does have an overview of how to uh, best utilize Texas Legislature online. It's on our website and you can find it there. Um, the reason we wanted to run through our legislative agenda first is we also want to hear from you, your groups, on your legislative uh, priorities, your agendas, things you are looking out for or advocating for in the next session. So I'm going to leave this slide up here for a minute and then bump it to the next. But And I'm going to turn it over to Annalisa to maybe uh, kickstart this portion of the meeting. But this is time for you if you have a group that has priorities or concerns for the legislature to uh, please feel free to speak up. So uh, Annalisa, if you want to kick start it off with some. Yeah, because I did notice of people who uh, had responded that they were going to be on the meeting today, that there were several of you that are representing groups that have legislative agendas. And so I wanted to, without putting you on the spot, I'm not going to call people out by name, but if you are uh, with uh, one of the groups uh, that has a legislative agenda, we would uh, welcome uh, for you to take this opportunity and talk a little bit about what your group's going to be working on during this session. And you can just go ahead and uh, either raise your hands or at this time, just chime in. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, how's it going, y'all? Whoops. Good, good. Hey, we, um, we, this is Jennifer Walker from National Wildlife Federation. Um, we are going to have our policy priorities, but we're still planning those right now. Um, we actually had a meeting today about that. And, and these are shared priorities for Texas Living Waters, um, which is a coalition of National Wildlife Federation, Sierra Club, um, uh, the Nature Conservancy, Hill Country Alliance, and Galveston Bay Foundation. And so the things that were on the menu, so to speak, for us today were supporting the implementation of the state flood plan. The state flood plan has a lot of, um, mm -hmm. of legislative uh, recommendations in it. Um, and, and we, and I know GIA and some other groups were very involved in the flood planning process. And so it's a great opportunity because this first state flood plan just got released. And then, and then these items are the legislative recommendations. So it's, it's a good opportunity to run, to pick them up and run with them. And hopefully legislators are thinking the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, water supply and infrastructure, there um, is a lot of chatter about, about um, water infrastructure funding this session, what form and how much it'll take, we don't know. So we're keeping our recommendations 
our priorities general, but we will be supporting additional investment um, in water supply and water infrastructure. However, we'll be thinking about um, prioritizing investment in resilient water supply structures. I mean, water supply strategies, really focusing on water loss mitigation, reuse, conservation, even ASR. Um, and then uh, we'll develop some priorities around environmental flows um, and thinking about like water master at TCQ, um, funding for the SB3 adaptive management process. And then of course, water quality and wastewater and just um, really, we're, we're still working on these, um, but thinking about establishing water quality standards and um, pristine streams and things like that. And then, you know, the state agencies have their funding lists out, their requests through the LAR, the legislative appropriation request. So taking a close look at those and seeing which elements of those we wanna support. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, do we have anybody else here on the call who would like to talk about uh, legislative agenda from their group? Hi, Elisa. It's Milan. Oh, uh, hi. Yeah, please do. <laughs> um, you know, I'm speaking kind of for two groups here. Um, TRAM, which is Texas for Responsible Agriculture Mining, we have been working on, it's an internal document right now because we've got some ongoing discussions with some uh, legislators already that we don't want to um, uh, usurp what they're trying to do. So, but we are working on um, some priorities. We've got a list of eight priorities right now. Uh, of course, a lot of it has to do with aggregate mining and the regulations or, or lack thereof in the state of Texas um, and working towards those goals. Uh, a, a lot of what we've covered here, water usage, water availability, where they're going to get the water resources and things like that is a top priority for us. Um, PHCE, our legislative priority that we've uh, included in with the TRAM group is that we feel like the WPAP, uh, the Water Pollution Abatement Plan, needs to become um, um needs to be turned into actually a permitting process uh, with a public hearing and input, uh, not just it being a plan, but actually a permit. So we've uh, created a legislative priority based on that. Um, and that's something that we're going to, PHCE will be pushing hard to our people. Um, and it includes a lot of the other things like public notices and things like that, that um, TCQ and applicants in the, in the aggregate industry aren't following correctly, like that incident that happened around San Marcos and Comal County um, with Five Star, um, you know, putting public notica notification in an Austin paper, not in the local paper. So we're pushing hard on some, some permitting things as well. Um, let me see, BMPs, we're working real hard to work on BMPs. Um, and then trying to come up with legislation for for the aggregate industry. And we're working with TACA. TRAM is working with TACA, trying to come up to with common sense legislation that both industry and the communities can uh, get their, their arms around. Thanks, Milan. And I'm, I'm going to translate a little bit. Uh, BMP is best management practice. And uh, those practices, a lot of them are outlined by the Texas Commission for Environmental Quality meant to mitigate pollution. Uh, and in, in uh, a lot of our research, we see that the, the BMPs that are required by the state are not actually uh, achieving the function of pollution prevention that they need to. And I want to uh, stress that um, I'm delighted to hear that y'all are going to ask for permitting for water pollution abatement plans for stormwater because it's been enormously frustrating for us. He has been asking for this for 20 years. And what it is is that we, you, you know, all of us who know the work that Gia does, that we go after these wastewater permits, uh, especially when it's uh, uh, discharging wastewater that that could harm our, our local water bodies or be recharged into the aquifer and it's not treated to high enough standards. But stormwater in these new developments poses an equal risk uh, to our water supplies, um, both groundwater and surface water. And under the, the way it's always been, 
the, the state TCEQ requires these water pollution abatement plans, but it's just a plan. We, unless we uh, keep on top of it and ask to specifically review and comment on those, we don't even see those. And so we would like to see this change to a permitting process where we have the same opportunities as we do with exactly. the wastewater permits to contest those permits and make sure that they are protective of our water supply. So we would be a hundred percent with you on this. Thank well, you. Well, I'll, I'll send you what we have put together it's as it, like i said it's phc's number one pr legislative priority um you know but tram mm -hmm. also you know has added it as, as as theirs as one of their priorities as well so um you know that and expanding county authority all sorts of things so a mm -hmm. lot of what you've already gone over through here we're in step with you and uh just let us know what we can do to help thank you do we have anybody else from any groups that wants to share what they're working on? No, then we can open up from questions in the audience. And Nathan, I, I uh, assume people are putting questions in the chat or you can raise your hand. Yeah, I have three questions on the chat right now. So moving forward, feel free to use the chat feature still. If you just want to raise your hand, that's great as well. And I will get to you, but I am going to take priority with the chat. First, uh, I have a question from Carol Pennington saying, is it possible to seek legislative protection of of the underground lakes, aquifers and rotations, like some above ground lakes have? And she mentioned bracketed zoning as reference in the county tools report. And... I'm, I, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Um, there, uh, you know, uh, with GIA, we are dealing principally with the Edwards and Trinity aquifers. Those are both karst aquifers that are highly vulnerable to pollution. And so under state law, the Texas Commission for Environmental Quality does have um, special uh, regulations that apply to the Edwards, not to the Trinity, but to the Edwards. Um, and so uh, we uh, spend a lot of time actually trying to strengthen those regulations to make sure that the measures that the state are, requires are adequately protective. And, and that's been an ongoing battle. So, um, yeah, we will continue to do that. Okay, thanks. And going off on the subject, it kind of leads into this next question. And it was briefly mentioned, I think Rachel mentioned it. Can you give a description about what is bracketing? And and I'm going to say this is not, you know, uh, we're, we're using the term bracketing loosely, mm -hmm. but within legislation, you have different options. One are one of the options that that I think is appropriate for our uh, for for Gia for a 21 county service area, because we do have these unique water supplies, is doing uh, local bills. It, when you have bills that are just not applying to the whole state, but only to a certain area, which we, you would call bracketed, it could be uh, counties or, or uh, uh, a certain region or a certain geographic area. In our case, we would say, um, um, you know, the Edwards Aquifer Recharge and Contributing Zone. We have uh, filed legislation that goes specifically to that purpose. So we don't really care if the rest of the state has uh, those regulations applied to it. We just want it for our region. And then with that type of legislation, if it goes through the committee and is approved by the committee, it has an opportunity to go on a local and consent calendar, which means it does not have to go before a full vote of the legislature. So so that's that's something that um, is allows more nuance in this legislation. That that could also be when we had in the past um, actually uh, uh, had legislation filed on our behalf to give counties more authority. That was bracketed to thirteen counties 
within our service area here in the Hill Country that needed special protections because of the growth and because of the environmental conditions, uh, in particular water supplies. So uh, we had said this does not apply to the entire state. And on that, we put a condition on that each county would have, it was written into the legislation, each the citizens of each county would have the opportunity to vote on that. And so that's another tool we can use. Now, another way, and I, I don't like to call this bracketing, but um, it's frequently a bill will come on statewide and we see that it has really bad implications for that. And an example of that is actually uh, uh, Senate Bill 2038, because during the last session, because of concerns uh, that that rolling back uh, the regulations in the into, uh, in the extraterritorial jurisdiction would have on Camp Bullis as well as on our Edwards Aquifer water supplies, uh, we were able to work with the with the um, uh, Army in. Uh, uh, the Camp Bullis folks and Joint Base San Antonio and, you know, all of us with environmental to get that area actually uh, exempted from SB 2038. So if, if there is a, a bill that we see that has, uh, you know, uh, could have an uh, oversized influence on, on our water supplies, we will make every effort to try to get uh, uh, our area exempted from that. And that's that's often uh, difficult to do, but I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. I believe that actually answers two questions because there was a general question about what browsing is and then what do you mean by indicative legislation? So I believe that answers both those questions. Yeah, and then so I would jump in, Nathan, on- Milan's question of whether it's true that state leaders are trying to limit bracketing. Um, we have heard that. Um, I have this week read the memo that was from, uh, I think it was the Texas Legislative Council, but I don't, don't quote me on that. I don't want to get the name wrong. Um, but I did read the memo on local and bracketing bills. And as far as I can tell, and I need to read it again, um, and, and maybe have some other folks read it too to confirm um, my interpretation of it is is that there has not been a change in the rules surrounding local bills or in bracketing bills. Um, again, I could be wrong, but just a plain reading of the, the memo in the drafting of uh, rules doesn't appear to be any change. Okay, and Malaya had another part to her question saying like, is it true that state leaders are trying to under bracketing? If so, how will that help the aquifers? <laughs> Good point. So yeah, if they do limit bracketing, it would make our jobs a lot harder. Um, but thankfully, at, at least again, as far as I can tell, we will need to do, a, I think, maybe a deeper dive if it is getting, if there are rumors around that bracketing is being limited, we'll need to do a deeper dive. And in, in that case, we would need to change some strategies. So yeah, good question, Milan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Let's see, next question I have is from Mark, and he asks, is there discussion of changing zoning codes to reduce the amount of single family zoning and allow for more duplexes, fourplexes, and more incremental development? However, yeah, anyway, I can't. oh, go ahead, uh, Lisa. Is, uh, the, the question's complete. Yeah, I, there will definitely be a discussion of that. Um, what we're, seen and I've been, uh, you know, following uh, uh, a lot of uh, reporting on this in the business journals and the real estate journals and like that is that we it's recognized that there is a need for affordable housing. And so they have asked the legislature to address and that will most likely include um, uh, attempts to uh, uh, do statewide regulations on, on some of these zoning things. What we're seeing is a trend that's very troubling actually of taking away uh, control from municipalities and I, I wouldn't say take away from county governments, they haven't had much control anyway, but, um, but to, uh, so we will see uh, 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 some pretty broad attempts to, uh, 
to consolidate regulations statewide. Now, there have been attempts at this in the past, and we were able to defeat those. One of the ones, I guess it was like three sessions ago, where it said that um, municipalities should not be able to enforce tree ordinances in their extraterritorial jurisdiction, or they, there was another, uh, they would not be able to enforce impervious cover limits. Now, uh, those are both measures that are wildly popular, and especially the tree ordinance, they, they really heard from them, and so we were able to defeat those efforts. And I think um, with, within, it's, it's something that you will have to be engaged in. Of course, with GIA's focus, we are not as focused on the urban areas because those areas are all already developed out. We're concentrating most of our focus on uh, preserving the environmental services that are provided by what is currently uh, agricultural lands, open space, and all within our service area that uh, especially provides uh, uh, the, uh, the clean water that replenishes our aquifer and our, our surface waterways. So we would not be getting as involved in, in uh, of actual municipal regulation as we would be and looking to protect the extraterritorial jurisdictions and the counties. But you can, I think it's pretty much guaranteed that there will be uh, attempts to challenge any kind of municipal regulations that have to do with uh, with uh, densities and, and uh, zoning within the municipalities. Awesome. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, another question that just came in uh, asks, will there be any opportunities to better protect the contributing zone? And I believe it's the Edwards contributing zone. That's what's being talked about. <laughs> That's a great question. I I mean, we'll be looking for them. And, and uh, what Stuart's referring to is, is the uh, contributing zone for the Edwards Aquifer currently um, Edwards Aquifer Authority regulations, most of them apply to uh, three miles into the contributing zone, but, but the science is now telling us, oh, thank you for that. The contributing zone is that big area on the top, the, the, uh, the khaki colored uh, zone, and, and what that is is that parts of that are also the recharge zone for the Trinity Aquifer system. And, uh, but the Trinity Aquifer is a much tighter formation. And so y'all know that this area, the landscape out in that area, it's, it's uh, very little soil cover, rocky soils. And so a lot of the stormwater that falls there, the rain ends up uh, moving across the land and entering the Edwards Aquifer in the Edwards Aquifer recharge zone, which is that blue zone, which is actually deemed as the most environmentally sensitive area in Texas. And so, in all of our policies, uh, we have been pushing for greater protection for the contributing zone, and we will continue to do that. And, and whether there's any opportunities in the legislature this session, if there are, we will certainly jump on them. And we will continue also through uh, the rulemaking uh, for TCEQ. Does anybody have anything to add to that one? Nothing to add. I think you answered it very well. I appreciate it. Um, another quick question that's come in, but um, it would ask, is there any other Senate bill or House bill numbers to keep an eye on, or should we just wait until the 89th session begins? Because I think like, SB 2038 was talked about. Um, is there any other, I guess, bills to keep an eye on? But I can believe the bills get assigned a number once the session begins, correct? Right. So the the way they go through it is is uh, yeah the the legislator will will file the legislation and it will be assigned a bill number, and then when that legislation is filed and assigned a number, uh, uh, then we will get an alert if it's in a topic that we're uh, following. If it's if it's on an issue that we're tracking, uh, we will get an alert. And I got I can't. Uh, uh, stress enough what a marvelous tool the Texas legislature online is, because if you have a particular issue that you're concerned about, 
you can flag that. And then every time a bill is filed that has to do with that issue, you'll get an alert. It will give you a link to the legislation, which you can read and any other pertinent documents. And that uh, we when GIA started 20 years ago, we were having to pay a lot of money for a service like this. And then um, the the Texas it's one of the best things Texas has done. They did this free service, Texas Legislature Online, which is enormous. You can go on there and you can look for uh, the dates of committee hearings, what the agendas are going to be on those committee hearings, uh, and, and then the, the uh, House votes and, and just everything related to the legislature. So it, it's, I really encourage you to get familiar with using that and to use it. And otherwise, if you don't want to do that deep of a dive, you can just wait for us to uh, catch our hair on fire during the session and start sending out alerts. Help us, help us. Awesome. Thank and I would you. just add, well, first I've put in the chat a link to our PowerPoint on how to use Texas Legislature Online. So it walks you through how to use it and sign up for alerts. Um, and then I think getting back to to the question Nathan asked, you know, when we talk about we're monitoring Senate Bill 2038 and the Death Star Bill and things like that, um, those are bills that have already been passed. And of course, we're monitoring whether there's any legislation that will come in that would expand those bills. So for Senate Bill 2038 on the extraterritorial jurisdictions, we're monitoring um, the impact of the bill, of course, but we're mainly monitoring where it is in the court case and then whether there are going to be further bills on that same subject, not necessarily whether the same bill will be um, reintroduced. And that may not be what the question was, and I may have misunderstood it, but um, when we talked about monitoring the Death Star in Senate Bill 2038, we're looking at the impacts in the court cases for those and whether there will be any subsequent legislation coming in this next session that um, amends or furthers those topics. Great, thank you. I appreciate it. So, one more question. I believe we're at 4:20, so I think we've got time for one or two more. Uh, this is more of an observation that's turned to a question. Uh, talking back bracketing as well. Did the practice of bracketing ever be eliminated that would put a stop to local bills, which is state public scrutiny, because they are placed on calendars? And they also mentioned this would make the creation of water control improvement districts and municipal utility districts much more difficult. Yeah, and I, I agree. I, I think, you know, the whole concept of, of uh, you know, doing away with uh, any any kind of local uh, or regional or geographic bracketing would be ridiculous because every session we have these water control and improvement districts, the municipal utility districts, all sorts of special districts, special uh, 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 districts or even uh, commissions that are appointed for certain areas to deal with, with regional problems. So I, I just think the prospect of that would, would frankly be absolutely ridiculous. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, another question that came in is asking about Gia's take on a on a, a bill passed in last legislator uh, it is HD 3697 and it severely restricts county authority to regulate responsible development and I'm asking if we would advocate repeal of it. Uh, you know, um, HB 3697, that's been something that um, our partner organization, Hill Country Alliance, has done a lot more research um, on. And we we do, I think, agree with uh, what they've found and their position on it, which I, I do think is to amend it or repeal it. But if you want uh, much more detail than uh, at least I can provide, maybe Annalise says something that she can weigh in on, uh, Hill Country Alliance, HCA, would be your best resources for this issue. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and it, you know, that I think we're incumbent on us as, as the Aquifer Alliance uh, during this session is to stress to uh, all the legislators, but but especially to those that represent us when, within this unique area that 
we are urbanizing so rapidly that a lot of these counties would they're no longer rural areas they are urban areas and as such uh, uh, the people who live within those areas are um, in need of the civilizing influence of regulation so uh, it's it's that's very high on our agenda but i think i think it's it's really uh, like i said incumbent on us with the growth that we're facing and everything uh to really let and and especially because there will be some newly elected uh uh representatives uh serving y'all to let them know that you feel very strongly uh, that local governments do need the tools to deal with these issues locally Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I believe that's all the questions we have in the chat. Um, I'll leave it open for another 30 seconds. So I'm going to speak now, forever hold your peace <laughs> on this. But as we all know, um, and Lisa and Rachel are readily available. Anyone at Kia is readily available to come and help you out, send you in the right direction um, with their emails right there. Um, and then we have a little bit more time. So, I mean, Annalisa, Rachel, any last minute advice, tidbits to anyone on this call to kind of get involved, more involved with the legislative session that you can recommend? Um, I, I will say that uh, uh, if you are with a group that's going to be active in the legislature or has an agenda, uh, for the past 20 years, Gia has been a member of the Alliance for Clean Texas, which is environmental groups from throughout the state who meets regularly uh, uh, during the session to coordinate our efforts. And so if, if you uh, want to get engaged in that uh, effort, go ahead and contact me because the uh, new members have to be approved by all, all the members of that coalition. But uh, it's definitely a worthwhile effort. Awesome. And I would just say, you know, stay involved if you're not signed up for alerts which again i think annalisa mentioned probably most of you are if you're on this call but if you're not or you have friends who you uh know would be interested in this topic or maybe live in one of our 21 counties that we we serve um have them sign up for the alerts just be on the lookout for those uh for important committee hearings for any time you know we ask you to reach out to your legislatures and again especially with the rate of uh, turnover in this upcoming election again we won't know anything until november 5th november 11th but really uh forging those connections with your legislatures so that that helps us when we can call upon you to ask you to help with your legislatures and you've already formed those relationships that's just really invaluable and also the elected officials really appreciate it um, when they can have those important uh, relationships with their constituents. So I think that would be, that's always the most important thing you can do is just stay on top of what's happening and forge those relationships. Yeah, and, and if you want to get involved uh, at a deeper level, um, if there are items coming up, and like I said, we'll be sending out alerts on some of these committee hearings for bills that we either strongly support or oppose, uh, you, you can go to those uh, committee hearings, you can sign up to speak. Uh, and, and go ahead and speak on any of the uh, topics that are on the agenda for that meeting. Um, and uh, it, I think uh, it's, it's I, I want you to feel that um, even if you're not like representing a big group of people and or you have your own uh, personal views on things, that the Capitol is actually open for you to share those views. And, and I would urge you to take those opportunities if you're in Austin. Sometimes it's really interesting, even if you're not going to, uh, you know, be speaking on a particular topic just to drop by. And speaking of dropping by, we had met with the GIA member groups. We're still trying to determine whether or not we'll have a, a legislative lobby day. If we do, that would most likely be in uh, uh, February or early March, but pro most likely late February. We'll let you know about that. And we've had that done that very successfully in the past where all the GIA members went up there. We all wore blue. Um, 
and went around and vi visited with all the uh, legislators uh, throughout the day and uh, had, uh, you know, some of uh, the uh, uh, one time we were actually recognized on the Senate floor for our efforts. So it's those those kind of events are really good and they're really important in letting the legislature know like, yes, we, we do care and we're there and we're going to be working on this and working with you. Thank you for that. And actually that went into the last question about um, will there be a play and lobby event in Austin? So uh, we're working on that. Stay tuned. If we find more details on that, we'll pass it along to our member groups and our website and keep everyone informed. So with that, uh, I believe we're done with Q&A. Uh, and so I am going to release everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending our 10th Water Walks event. Um, our next one is actually, it's not going to be until next year. Uh, we are taking a break for the upcoming holiday season with Thanksgiving and Christmas approaching with everyone's busy holiday schedules. So the Gia team is going to reconvene and kind of start developing our list of speakers for next next year, 2025, uh, to bring this Water Walk series back next year. So and we just want to thank you everyone for joining us and joining us every fourth Wednesday of the month and we appreciate your input we appreciate your support and we're excited to bring this back to you next year so stay on the lookout but with that thank you so much for joining us today and you're free to go so thanks everyone thank you thank y'all don't don't sign off yet because I want to look at the chat <laughs>